Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our 2019 Jump into STEM webinar series. I'm Melissa Lapsa from Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'm pleased to have Jim Leverett from Southern Company uh, joining the webinar today. This is our second webinar on smart sensors and controls for residential buildings. Jump into STEM is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy's Building Technologies Office with support from ORNL and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Vision with Jump into STEM is to inspire the next generation of building scientists by focusing on supporting creative ideation and diversity in the building science field. The Jump into STEM program provides a gateway or on-ramp for undergraduate and graduate students to experience the research and career possibilities of studying building science. Our intent is to attract students from diverse majors and diverse backgrounds. Jump into STEM is managed by Mary Hubbard from the U.S. Department of Energy, Dr. Kim Trenbath from NREL, as well as Jahi Simba from NREL, myself and Dr. Yunjin Bay, also from ORNL. The Jump into STEM challenges are open to any student enrolled in a U.S. college or university. Our professor team from Georgia Tech, Hampton University, University of Tennessee, Colorado School of Mines, Southern University, Clark Atlanta University, University of Alabama, and North Carolina A&T State University promote the jump into STEM at their school and may offer it in their classrooms this fall for a, grad for a student grade. Our advisory panel from ORNL, NREL, NSF, and ORAL provide guidance to us on outreach and the program as a whole. With Jump into STEM, our goals emphasize cultivating diversity of thought by underscoring the importance of interdisciplinary teams, inclusive of women and minorities. Jump into STEM works with university and college professors from a variety of disciplines to support creative building science challenges that can be integrated with coursework curricula. Jump into STEM's network includes leveraging public-private partnerships with industry partners and STEM organizations to support the annual student challenges and events. With this slide, you can see a quick snapshot of how the Jump into STEM student competition works. Eligible students can compete for up to four paid internships at either ORNL or NREL. You can go to jump.ideascale.com to view eligibility requirements and the full schedule. Click on How It Works at the top of the home page to view a step-by-step -step process on eligibility, building a team, ideation, and idea submission requirements. Also on the top navigation bar is a schedule for the Jump into STEM 2019-2020 competition. Eligible students can participate in any of the three concurrent online challenges running now through to November 15th. These challenges are supported by our online webinar series designed to provide insights on industry practices, market issues, and other supporting resources to help students build and generate their idea solutions. Additionally, throughout the competition, Jump into STEM will host periodic events to spur innovation and creative thinking. After the three challenges close on November 15th, the Jump into STEM team will run a judging process to select finalists to compete on January 31st, 2020, in a final event, which will be held either at NREL or ORNL. During the final event competition, judges will award the 2020 Jump into STEM internship winners. The first 2019-2020 Jump into STEM challenge topic is focused on smart sensors and controls for residential buildings. Participating competitors interested in this challenge topic should develop a unique application that uses sensor data in residential buildings for the purpose of reducing energy, maintaining or improving occupant comfort, and or to provide better responsiveness to the electric grid. Strong Ideas will present a proposed approach identify the sensor data, and how the data will be used. The idea should also discuss anticipated impact and detect a market plan for the application.
The second Jump into STEM challenge topic is to design a healthier and energy efficient air distribution system for a small commercial building setting using your local climate zone. Strong Ideas will identify a novel system for the selected climate zone and will present implementation of the solution in a hypothetical or existing building. The solution should articulate the expected impact from the design system and also include a tech-to-market plan. Finally, the third jump into STEM challenge topic is focused on pushing the envelope with innovative wall retrofit designs. Students are challenged to design a residential wall retrofit product or system that can address replacement or supplement of current leaky and unhealthy walls. Strong Ideas will identify how the wall retrofit will work and will be inclusive of details on how to address the issues of moisture and air tightness. Additionally, the idea solution should address one or more of the following issues, low indoor air quality, high energy costs, and our high retrofit costs. Like the other Jump into STEM challenge topics, the idea solution should include a tech-to-market plan. So last year, we had a successful uh, uh, Jump into STEM challenges, and our final event was held in uh, conjunction with the Solar Decathlon at NREL. At our final event, uh, finalists were able to pitch the ideas in person and network with other students, professors, industry stakeholders, and lab staff. The results were we had three uh, successful internships awarded for the summer, two at NREL and one at ORNL. I won't uh, go through all of the, the text on these slides, but I uh, wanted to share with you what the three internship winners were able to work on at NREL or ORNL. These slides will be posted on our website following the webinar, so you can go back and reference the slides while you're working on your idea submissions for our Jump into STEM challenges for this year. And again, I want to encourage everyone um, to go to the website and register on the website. If you have any questions while you're working through the challenges, feel free to email us at jump at ornl.gov. So with that, I would like to introduce Mr. Jim Leverett from Southern Company. Jim is a research engineer with the Southern Company Building Energy Systems R&D Group in Birmingham, Alabama. He joined in 2015 and is responsible for the research portfolio around residential and commercial HVAC, water heating, automation, and building envelope systems. At Southern Company, Jim has worked extensively on the Alabama Power Smart Neighborhood Project as a technical lead. He has directly managed more than $5 million and has been responsible for the overall design and deployment of the residential building technologies. Prior to coming to Southern Company, Jim worked for a Rochester, New York-based engineering firm as a consultant to NYSERDA, focused on field audits, data locking, engineering, and economic analysis for building energy systems. Jim has a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Tennessee Tech and is a registered professional engineer certified energy manager. With that, I'll turn it over to Jim. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and show his slides. And if you have any questions uh, during the, the Jim's presentation, uh, you can enter them into the chat feature, and we will open up the lines following his presentation. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. This is Jim Leverett with Southern Company. I've been working in the research and development group here for the last few years, as Melissa just uh, mentioned. And I'm excited to get to talk to you guys today about sensors and controls in residential buildings. So before we move on into the slides, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background about why we care about that, and we being the utilities. Um, I probably should have put it in here, but it didn't. There's a Sankey diagram put out by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory that shows the energy consumption in the United States. It shows it shows all the primary sources of energy on the left side and a flow across the diagram to the right where that energy is used and how it's being used. 
And if you look up that diagram online, you'll see that the vast majority of all energy in the United States is consumed in buildings, whether that's residential, commercial, or industrial facilities. And so Southern Company, uh, which is the power company for much of the Southeast, a lot of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, has a research and development team focused on building systems because most of the energy that we produce is used inside of these buildings. And so what we want to do from a utility perspective is really try to understand how is energy being used inside of facilities and how will it be used in the future so that we can better serve our customers and work with them. One of the big concepts that's come up in recent times is the Internet of Things. I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with that. Um, but as the Internet of Things has proliferated and more and more devices are incorporating communications and control systems, it's opened up a lot of new avenues to potentially interact, uh, to have customer devices, things in a customer building, whether that's a home or whatever, interact with the power system. So if we can uh, work together, we can potentially reduce costs, reduce uh, costs for energy, while also improving reliability and you know, maintaining or improving customer satisfaction. And so that's really the big idea behind all of this from our perspective. So if you go to the first slide here, to the next one, um, I will you'll end. see. Jim, Jim, I just wanted to mention that you're a little bit staticky. And I, if you're using your computer audio, you might be a little bit too close to the microphone. OK, I'm on my headset, but let me see if I can um, change it up here. Hold on. OK. Is this any better? It's still a little bit staticky for me, but it's okay. It's I can definitely hear you. Okay, I'm I'm talking directly into the phone right now, so I'm not sure what else I can do at the moment. Okay, okay, please proceed. So, Thank you. All right, sorry about that, guys. Hold on one second. All right, um, so this first uh, diagram just shows you guys a lot of the components that go into residential homes these days. I'm, if you guys grew up in a single family home or you live in one now, you probably recognize a lot of these. Um, and really what I wanna focus on here are the interactive systems or the systems that use energy. So the primary ones are um, the water heating system, the HVAC variable capacity heat pump system, and um, anything else might, that might be more customer facing. So security systems, lighting, um, bug loads, things like that. So uh, this is actually a diagram that we created for a project that we're working on called the Smart Neighborhood. And we'll talk a little bit more about that down the road. But I think the important thing to think about is um, a lot of residential construction is fairly similar in that you typically have uh, space heating and cooling is the largest load in the facility. Water heating is likely the second largest load. And then you have several other things that make up the remainder. But between space conditioning and water conditioning, you're at more than half of the energy consumption in a building. So <clears throat> if there's a way to integrate the heat pump and the water heater systems into the grid, <clears throat> then that provides the best opportunity for a utility and a customer to work together to manage the energy typically. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> Sorry guys. Um, so having prefaced all that, uh, with, having prefaced this with some of the major end uses in the home, what I wanted to talk about, one of the challenges in this uh, smart sensors and control space is platforms. And so I went out and pulled down a bunch of different major vendors and platforms that uh, work in this space in one way or another. Um, and, you know, when you're working with a customer, you will have to often work with whatever type of system they have, or you have to find a way to encourage them to adopt the system that you already work with. And so that's a big logistical challenge in that there's a lot of different uh, protocols and there's a lot of different um, custom or proprietary APIs that you may have to interface with. Um, so, and actually, if you advance the slide one more, 
what you'll see is that there's some attrition in these systems as well, right? So um, at least three of these systems have been basically rolled back by the manufacturer and they no longer sell those devices new. And so, you know, you have to think about things like legacy support, you know, is a system that we implement today in a, with a customer, is that going to be around for uh, 20 years or 30 years, which is the time horizon that a lot of power companies are looking for when they're looking at technology. So, you know, if it's an alternative between working with customer loads or putting in hardware uh, on the power grid, then we know that the hardware is going to last for an extended period of time. And so you have to think through some of the challenges about longevity and support uh, well after that first day where it's operational. If you go to the next slide, um, I'm sure many of you guys have seen this comic strip before, XKCD, it's, uh, but it, it really is very true, right, that there are uh, standards and there are standards to try to standardize the standards, and in the end, you end up with a lot of different uh, communication pathways. Um, I think the biggest takeaway here, other than just complexity, is the challenge for durability and repeatability. So much like with that last slide where vendors may go out of business or may just decide we don't want to support this anymore, um, you have to think about just your own experience in a building. Have you ever had a computer or a device that dropped off the Wi-Fi for some reason? And so if a utility is depending on customer devices um, that are communicating through Wi-Fi, then you're going to have to take into account some sort of attrition factor in how many of those devices are actually going to be connected at any given time, potentially. Um, and much the same thing with any of the other systems as well. So when we're looking at using sensors and controls in the utility space, that certainty and, flexi and flexibility is something that we're still working to quantify uh, as a utility. If you go to the next slide. All right, so this is really where we see a lot of the major opportunities with uh, customer-sided assets and sensors and controls. Um, so I'll go through each one of these for a minute, right? So um, uh, let's start with renewables. So integrating renewables into the power system. So historically, power generation is a fairly uh, predictable and fixed um, type of work where you can plan for a power plant to come online, you can get a good idea what the load's going to be, and you can serve that load at any given time. Obviously, renewables, uh, primarily wind and solar, are very um, uncontrollable in that, you know, whenever you have weather come through, you get wind and you may put shade on the solar panels, but it's really a lot more challenging to predict those um, very minute uh, micro weather changes than it is to plan for traditional generation. And so by being able to communicate with customer loads in a given region, we expect that we'll be able to better accommodate renewable energy on the grid by being able to better synchronize loads to generation. So can we absorb excess solar energy in thermal batteries, aka water heaters, during the middle of the day? Uh, that are near a solar field? Or can we defer some of our load until, you know, until nighttime when we expect the wind farm to come online? Things like that are going to be instrumental in the integration of these variable power resources that are coming online. Um, detailed usage. So the power company uh, has a lot of interest in understanding where the power is being used in buildings because it gives us the ability to better forecast our needs for power plants and for other uh, hardware. So by potentially having smart devices that are in homes that will, will be able to communicate with the grid, we can get a better understanding of how devices are operating, when they're operating, what kind of power they're using, and that'll help planning uh, move forward to be more accurate in the future. Uh, fault detection and diagnostics. This isn't really utility centric per se, but um, there's a lot of value in being able to provide detection of resources back to homeowners or business owners, being able to say, I think that the water heater has a problem or will have a problem shortly because of something that's going on right now. 
Uh, most HVAC and water heater replacements are emergency replacements because nobody, most people don't typically plan for and budget for those. And so whenever they go out, they want to get those replaced immediately. So whatever is on a contractor's truck is typically what goes in. And that means that's a challenge for integrating these devices into the grid because a lot of times the lowest cost item that may be on a contractor's truck may not have communications built into it um, or may not have something that will enable it to work with the grid. And so making these items, uh, bring down the cost of that integration and making it more ubiquitous is something that's going to be key in implementing this. Obviously convenience, right? So if you're able to uh, provide additional value to the, to the owner um, by being able to control it remotely or being able to provide additional detection remotely, that's huge benefit. Automatic grid response. Uh, so what we have seen is that most homeowners, most business owners don't want to be, you know, they don't care about their energy enough where they would want to be bothered with it on a regular basis. And so these devices need to be smart enough that they can work at least semi-autonomously uh, and that they can work in conjunction with the grid semi-autonomously. If we, the utility, send a price signal and we know it's going to be a lot more expensive in the afternoon, then the ability for that device to make some intelligent decisions ahead of time in order to mitigate the usage during that time period is really good for the customer and really good for the utility. And then finally, energy efficiency. Um, if you don't know, if you can't measure how much energy you're using, you can't really control it effectively. And so by having those sensors and controls out there, you'll be able to make more informed decisions about how you utilize your resources. If you'll go to the next slide. So this is a, uh, a document or a graph we got from the Brattle Group, which is a consulting firm that does a lot of reporting and white papers. And really what I wanted to include this for is just to show you some of the um, minimal, you know, this is sort of like the thresh, minimum threshold in my mind of benefit um, by being able to integrate and control these devices. So we're talking about, you know, billions of dollars per year in opportunity um, through several different categories. So avoided generation capacity is effectively being able to, you know, avoid the need to produce power. So that may be uh, shaving the peak off of the grid during the maximum time, say the hottest day of the year, maybe 4 or 5 or 6 p.m., or in the beginning of the year, January, around 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, and then there's other potential opportunities. So that's the traditional historical opportunity. Um, but then there's uh, some others over there on the right side that you can see as far as, you know, basically wires capacity, um, ancillary services, providing different types of power uh, back to the grid, frequency regulation, things like that. And then avoided energy costs, just being able to reduce the total consumption. So a little bit of that energy efficiency opportunity. If you'll go to the next slide. So what I wanted to do here in the last part of the presentation is just mention two or three projects that we are working on at Southern Company in this space to give you guys some idea, uh, guys and gals, some idea of what's going on at the utility. Um, and maybe it'll give you some ideas about things you can do. Um, the first is the, is the Alabama Power and Georgia Power Smart Neighborhood Project. So Southern Company uh, in Birmingham and Atlanta is building two cutting edge uh, pilot projects to look at the interaction of smart energy efficient homes with distributed energy resources, uh, solar batteries and generators. And what we're really trying to do is understand at scale. So we've got 108 homes here uh, and more, more than a megawatt and a half of power output we're trying to understand what is the opportunity uh, by controlling HVAC and water heating in coordination with the uh, solar and battery and generator systems. What is the economic opportunity and what are the technical challenges to accomplishing that? Uh, we're 
working heavily with uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory on this project. They've been uh, instrumental in some of the control systems that are being used in this project uh, to control the customer loads and on the microgrid side. And really, the, the value of these projects is that we can talk about conceptually this opportunity like we have in the first part of the presentation here, but until we actually find where the rubber meets the road, you know, you won't really understand what the, the biggest challenges are and how to overcome those challenges and make it uh, widely scalable. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a diagram that shows a little bit of the interaction that we have in that Smart Neighborhood project. So um, this is for the Georgia Power project, which in Georgia, in Atlanta, um, we're con communicating and controlling um, customer heat pumps, customer water heaters, and EV chargers. And then each customer also has rooftop solar and a battery in the garage. You can see all those assets on the right side of the screen. And then um, you see, you know, a very crude high-level diagram sort of showing some of the inner operability and complexity that we have going into this. Um, so that white circle in the middle is the Wi-Fi router. It's a ubiquity system. Um, but basically, we're having to communicate to half a dozen or more different vendors, and we're having to have a way that we can send them all signals reliably, um, where we can get feedback from them, in order to understand the impact we're having. And this diagram doesn't really do it justice um, of the complexity and amount of legwork that had to go in on the front end in order to make this happen. But um, I guess the point, right, is that um, there's a lot of integration work that has to go on in order to um, make these things work right. The top left in that teal or bluish color box is some of the inputs that we're sending into this control system in order to make decisions about what do we need to do with the water heating and the HVAC, how do we maintain customer comfort, but also minimize or you know maximize positive impact on the on the power grid in the area as well. If you go to the next slide, um, we're also doing a pilot in Atlanta with 100 uh, homes where we're just controlling water heating. So we're looking at minimizing um, peaks in the morning and in the afternoon um, by shifting the runtime of the water heater. So the great thing about water heating is that obviously it's a massive thermal battery. And so in general, if you have a typical or traditional water heater, you have a massive thermal reservoir sitting there in your garage or basement or attic or wherever your water heater is located, such that you can actually turn that unit on and off. And there's that giant buffer between what the unit's doing and what the customer's doing. So we've seen a much uh, more near-term opportunity to control water heaters potentially because there's a lot, it's a lot easier to do that without impacting customers. If you go to the next slide. Um, Really, this is the last slide, and I just wanted to talk about the grid of the future. So most power systems today are very linear. You have a power plant, you send that power down wires to a substation, and then you send it down more wires to a home or a business. But in the future, uh, we see distributed energy resource management systems, DERMs, as being a networked system with multiple generators um, both on customer sites and at utility sites, working with loads all across the system, sort of as a matrix in order to best serve each customer as their energy needs come up. Given all of that information, um, or given all of the proliferation of Internet of Things technology and smart systems and you know some of the things that are still coming down the pipeline like 5G, um, we think this is going to be the future. And so there's a lot of challenges that need to be addressed, as we talked about already, in order to make this a reality. A lot of those around how do we integrate the system together? How do we make it seamless? How do we prevent or minimize impacts on customers if we're integrated with some systems in their, uh, in their home or premise? And then how do we do all of that and provide value to the grid such that we can provide it in a reliable way over an extended period of time where homeowners may come and go, they may buy and sell homes. 
So with all of that being said, the last slide is just, uh, I mean, that's it pretty much. You can advance to the last slide. And I think we're ready to take questions if anybody has any. Great, thanks so much, Jim. That was an excellent presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can go out and see if there are any questions. If you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll open up your line. Again, you can find out more about the Jump into STEM challenges by logging on our website at jump.ideascale.com and registering on the website. And then you can see the three challenges. Well, that's also where, where we will be linking the webinars for each of the challenges. And they are going to close on November 15th. And then after that time, we will have a panel of judges for each of the three challenges. And the finalists will then be notified after they're selected. And those finalists will be invited to participate in a final event at ORNL or NREL. Location is still to be decided. And those finalists will pitch their uh, ideas in person with their teams. And then the, the winning the winners will be invited for a paid summer internship for next summer at ORNL or NREL. Give it just a couple more minutes to see if anyone. Let's see. I do see some. Yeah. It, so Daniel here. asked about Daniel asks about the lack of privacy from having sensors in a facility or a house or yeah. a business. And I guess what I'll say is um, you're absolutely right. There's a trade-off there in privacy versus accessibility and controllability. Um, but I think what we are seeing, the opportunity is that, I think as of maybe a year ago, as the most recent numbers I've looked up, there was like 13 million smart thermostats in the United States already. And so the question is, can we leverage sensors, AKA thermostats, that customers are already willing to install and have already chosen to install um, for the benefit of the grid and the customer. So I think, I guess what I'm saying is that you're right, there's a trade-off, but I think it's a trade-off that millions of Americans have decided is worth it for convenience. So, you know, we want to, as a utility, manage privacy very heavily. It's one of our biggest concerns uh, in general, and we've done that with AMI data in the past. You know, we manage that really carefully. Um, but is there a way for us to link up to existing thermostats and not try to get tons of information about what's going on inside the home, but just be able to use that thermostat as a grid resource um, during times where it's really needed? Great. Thank you, Jim. And Dr. Olu, did you have a question? He needs to unmute his line so that we can hear him. I think if you press star four. Dr. Olu, can you press star four? Dennis, are you able to unmute him for him? He, I cannot unmute his equipment, but he is unmuted, okay. ready to talk for Blue Jeans. Okay. While we're waiting. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Dr. Olu. Okay. Um, I know um, I'm hearing some echo, but uh, I'll go ahead and the question. This is to do with the uh, scenario, if we look at the building as a living organism and uh, where you have a sick building and is kind of dependent on bandwidth in terms of feedback, uh, as you make the building smart, what effect will the bandwidth 
just like we're talking of the 5G now, how about some of the devices that you are talking about in terms of the grid interactive efficient building? And on that also, with the pilot program that you guys are doing here in Atlanta or in Alabama, uh, I know certain buildings have been selected, but what is the, based on your experience, what is the feedback when you are gathering real-time data? What is the effect of that on the bandwidth also? So let me make sure I understand. Your question is really how much bandwidth do we need as far as what frequency of data back and forth? And what's the feedback from the project that we're doing? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, basically, um, maybe try muting it again, Dr. Alou. Oh, uh, All right. All right. All right. Okay. I think that's better. Um, in, in terms of bandwidth, what we've seen is that we're actually really limited by the way the vendors are set up. A lot of vendors have configured their systems to minimize cost. And so they may only do an update, a ping to their device, say, once every 15 minutes or so. And then when you start to concatenate several of the different layers of systems that you have, um, you can be talking about a very significant delay in uh, one signal being sent to one signal being received and acknowledgement being sent. And I think that's been one of the biggest challenges that we've learned about from this pilot because we expected that we would be able to communicate much more rapidly down to devices than we have been in, than we actually have been able to. As far from the utility perspective, I think the, the, that level of communication really depends on the use case. So for demand response, basically um, a lot of the more traditional demand management and curtailment and uh, load shifting, something on the order of 15 minutes is fine. It's not really a big deal that there's that much of a delay. But when you start talking about some of the other opportunities, uh, ancillary services or more rapid response to local renewables, then that's going to be too long. It's not going to, it's not going to be quick enough, and you're going to need more on the so somewhere along the second, you know, second by second interaction to make those a lot more feasible. Um, I think so. That's some information, and then um, I guess I'm not really sure. Did that answer your questions? Uh, yes, that will answer the question. Uh, it's just also to think of uh, the affordability for like the low income neighborhood. How will they be able to keep up with the pace in terms of uh, some of the devices that are being integrated into the smart building from energy retrofitting point of view? Those are some of the things that I was. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Lou. I'm not sure if you asked another question. I couldn't tell. No, I just make a comment on the affordability okay. for low-income neighborhoods. As those uh, studies are going on, whether you also take that into consideration. Yeah, I think that's a huge piece. And, and the example I can think of offhand is that low uh, sorry, so backing up. So putting the technology across all income spectrums is really important. And the ch one of the biggest challenges with low income is that they may not have an existing network. A lot of low income homes do not have a wired internet connection. And so you have to come up with some sort of backhaul method that doesn't rely on, on a customer device or a customer internet connection. Yes. Yes. Thank you. No problem. All right, I see a couple more questions on the um, on the chat here. So, how, uh, Cheryl asked about EMF impacts. Um, so I will just say we're not really 
dealing with that in that we're not saying any way one way or the other. We're just looking to leverage existing infrastructure that's already there. So if a customer has Wi-Fi, then, we're want, then we want to work with their Wi-Fi system. If they don't have Wi-Fi, if they you know, just have a cell phone in their house, then we want to figure out a different way to communicate to their devices. Um, so we're not asking or forcing customers to adopt anything that they don't want to do. We're just trying to work with them and meet them wherever they're at. Uh, guest number five asked about how much projected savings using sensor technology is dependent upon standardized behavior. Does the continued growth of the gig economy have impact the savings and functionality? I mean, I think that is something we don't have a quantified answer for today in that I can't tell you um, we are going to save X, Y, Z by coordinating and controlling uh, water heater systems in um, or HVAC systems in every home. We've got some very average numbers and gener generic numbers, but there are so many factors that go into those numbers. Um, the type of home you live in, the type of equipment you have, how you use it, what your interaction is with that system. And so definitely people working from home will have an impact because if, if a building is empty during the peak hours of the day, there's potentially more flexibility for the grid because you can, you're not worried about keeping someone comfortable. Whereas if you have somebody working at home, you may not have that flexibility. All right, Daniel asked, how much does zone save in HVAC? Let's see. Um, you know, I think zone, so that's a little bit tangential to the conversation, I think, but it really just depends on how you use the system and how your space is configured. So, you know, a lot of, um, uh, in, in Alabama, a lot of one-story homes are one, one zone, and two-story homes will either be two systems or they may be two zones, depending on how things are set up. Um, if you have people in all zones all the time, you're not going to save any money. If you have people or if you have zones that are never used in your home, like if you have two guest bedrooms that are only used infrequently and you were able to zone those off, you could actually get some – you could probably get some good savings, right? So really a lot of the savings goes into how are the customers, how are the owners actually utilizing that system and how is the space laid out? Great. Does anybody else have any questions? I see one question, Jim, from David Yull. Um, so David, if you want to unmute your phone, um, you had a question about water heating. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is David Yule. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So it looked like you were talking about um, heat pump type water heaters. Uh, and I guess my understanding is that a, a big challenge with heat pump water heaters is that uh, we we want to just barely right size them for the maximum capacity because um, additional capacity is expensive in terms of first costs. And so I, I, I guess it seems to me very challenging to be able to find a time when we could limit demand by, by say, shutting off um, those heat pump water systems because it's it's very hard to know when we're going to need the, the capacity. You know, is somebody going to want to wash dishes or take a shower or something? Um, so did, in your ongoing project, did you have any um, kind of experience with that? And is, am I wrong about um, that being an issue? Yeah, in water heating, especially with tank type water heaters, whether they're heat pump or just electric, they really only run a small fraction of the day. So um, a 50-gallon or an 80-gallon water heater may run two, three, maybe four hours a day. Um, the other 20-plus hours a day, they are, um, they're not running. And the reason they're not running is because they have a reservoir of 50 gallons or 80 gallons of water at the temperature that the homeowners wanted at. So the flexibility you gain here is that you have that thermal mass that's really well insulated. So it doesn't matter when, like when you take a shower or you do a load of dishes, that doesn't mean your water heater is running because you have a giant reservoir of hot water. What you normally happens is you will take a long shower or do a load of dishes or laundry. And then at the end of that or near the end of that, the water heater will actually turn on to replenish that supply of water. So 
depending on what the customer is doing, there's a lot of buffer capacity there to meet the load the customer is already in the process of um, utilizing and then say just keep it off so just don't let it turn back on immediately and then you know later in the day or at a strategic time you can have it recharge um, it's sort of the concept so I think that's how we're we've seen it not we haven't really seen a lot of concern because it's not trying to meet the load at the same time that you're using the load like a tankless it's really the it's decoupled from when it's running to when it's being used if that makes sense So if if there's, I guess we size the water heater for the one time when the, the homeowners may have three showers in a row or something like that. And, and so it seems to me that if there's capacity to be able to shut the water heater off at some time, that means that basically the water heater was oversized. I guess that was my concern. Yeah, so, so in residential systems, there's, two or three stand, or half a dozen standard sizes, and you're basically getting one of those water heaters uh, no matter what, and there's not really a design that's done on the front end by the contractor or builder 99% of the time. So most of the time, um, yeah, you're not getting an actual design system. I think the other piece of it is that um, they're not designed to be instantaneous systems. So a tankless water heater is designed to have the exact capacity you need during the time you need it because it's basically taking water in, heating it, sending it to you immediately. A tank type water heater, the one you probably, you may have in your house today, the one most people I know have in their house, you, when you use that hot water, it takes another hour, give or take, to recharge that water heater after you drain it of hot water. So it's not that it's, too big or too small, it's just those water heaters aren't designed to meet capacity in real time. Does that make sense? Yep. Great. Well, thank you everyone for participating in the webinar today. We really appreciate all the great questions and especially want to thank Jim for his excellent presentation. And again, I want to encourage everyone to go to jump.ideascale.com and review those three concurrent challenges that are going on and don't meet, miss the deadline of November 15th to put your creative ideas in there. If you have any questions, you can email me at jump at With that, we will close out the webinar. Thank you very much.